I created this character to use in my indie RPG game. Let's call him Bob. Now, don't get me wrong, Bob looks nice as far as 64 by 64 pixels character sprite goes, but I think we can make him cooler. How, you might ask? Well, you probably can guess from the title, I want to customize his colors. So I set out to do just that. The immediate thought is to use a shader. After all, that's what shaders are for. Programs that run on the graphics card and control how the pixels on the screen are rendered. Before we jump immediately to shaders, there's one more consideration we need to go over. If you are used to using Godot, you know there is a thing called modulate. Instead of deciding what the pixel's color should be, you can modulate the existing color to give it a uh, sort of tint. But it comes with a bunch of headache that I don't want to get into. For example, if you want to target a very specific color value with this, you would have to figure out what modulation you need to arrive at the color. You can't simply pick the color and hope that it lands on it. So this is a no-go for me. Let's get back to the shader. Select a sprite node, scroll down to materials, create a material, create a shader, and write a few lines of code that basically says, if you see a specific color, replace that color with another. But hold on, this has a problem. Well, several problems actually, but I'm thinking about this one specific problem. Go ahead, pause and try to guess what it is. I'll wait. Got it? The main issue is this. What if different parts of the sprite also share the color? then this shader would replace the parts that I didn't want. Sure, I can design the sprite so that colors do not overlap, but if the player changes the shirt color to match the hair, then try to change the color again, both the hair and the shirt now have the same color, so they would both change. The simplest solution seeking part of our brain might say, hey, let's separate the sprite into multiple customizable portions so the shaders are applied separately. This might solve the issue, but still, what if I wanted to add more details? Do I keep separating the sprites into smaller and smaller pieces until there is no overlap? Maybe, but I didn't like that. This doesn't put my mind at ease. So I got to thinking, there has to be a better way. Is there a way to pre-categorize the pixels? That way I can target just one category of pixels. Then I remembered, you can save the sprite in a way that instead of pixels being represented by color values individually, they can point to a color in a palette. This is called the indexed mode because the pixels are just index numbers referring to a spot in a palette. So the hair can be color number one and the shirt can be color number two. And color number one and color number two could be the same. It'll still be distinguishable as one and two. Genius. Now all I have to do is make the shader work based on the index instead of colors. So I looked at Godot's shader document to see how to access the index number instead of colors. And to my surprise, I could not find anything. Surely I'm not the first one to think of this. Surely other people need this functionality too. But no. Now, I could do the same thing and search for Godot plugin for using palette index and shader. But I did an all into a full time indie dev and YouTuber life by being sane. After all, this is a fun learning opportunity. And how hard could it be, right? Famous last word. So I decided to make this plugin myself. To start, I chose to focus on the more popular graphics format that I knew had index mode built in PNG file. Portable Network Graphics, a format intended to be small for network uses. And what's more impressive is that unlike JPEG, it is lossless, meaning the compression to make it small does not sacrifice any information. This is cool and all, but that means the file isn't just a simple stream of RGB values. It has an elegant algorithm that makes it small and lossless. So I had to learn how to parse this file. I looked up PNG format specification, AKA RFC 2083 published in March, 1997. I don't know about you, but I haven't had the need to read any specifications like this in a while. In fact, I actually never had to read one before. And let me tell you, it is 
dense. The beginning is simple though. There are chunks and each chunk starts with bytes indicating what type of chunks they are and how large the chunk is. And depending on the chunk type, the specification explains what information is stored within the chunk and in what order. For example, here's a chunk type called IHDR and this is a metadata chunk. And the document explains that the first four bytes are width of the image and the next four bytes are height and the next compression method, filter method, etc., etc. Even reading palettes were as simple as just reading a chunk named PLTE. The real complex part, which ended up taking 99% of my time while working on this, is what is called an IDAT chunk. This is where the pixels are stored. And let me warn you, it is about to get technical, but I'll try my best to explain this as quickly and understandably as possible. So buckle up. PNG uses what's called a deflate compression method, which is two part compression. Let's say you have two pixels in the image. Here you can see the second pixel is identical to the first. So instead of writing the numbers twice, the compressor will take the second pixel and turn it into three, three. First three is a copy length and the second three is a copy distance. This means when you get to this part of the data, you copy the data three bytes away and do it for three bytes long. Let's look at another example. Here we have these five bytes, 255, 200, 200, 9, 3. If you were to decompress this, you would get 255 for red, 200 for green, 200 for blue. Then we see a pair of numbers for copy. And it says copy from three bytes prior. So that's starting from 255. Then do that for nine bytes long. And now you have four pixels of the same color totaling 12 bytes that were stored as five bytes originally. Of course, I'm way oversimplifying this, but I think this is enough for explaining the basic concept. And this compression method is known as the LZ77 compression. But we're not done. Remember I said PNG is a two-part compression? The second part goes like this. We take the result of the first compression, then count up how many times each of the numbers occur. Then they are sorted from the most frequent to the least frequent. So you get something like this. And then a binary tree is generated with this list in this order. Notice how each path of the tree is notated with either zero or one. These zeros and ones are what encodes the values. So here the original byte value 255 at the top would be encoded as zero. And then down here, this byte value 120 would be encoded as 1101. And thanks to the sorting we did earlier, the more frequently used values get closer to the top, giving it a shorter code, hence more space saved. This is known as the Huffman coding. So now you know how PNG compression works in a nutshell. But could you believe it if I said understanding this is only the beginning? Talking about all the struggles I went through and how to actually implement this in practice would be very tedious. So I will spare you the details unless you want to hear about it. If so, type I am a sucker for pain, give me more down in the comments. If there's enough of you, I will make the video explaining it all in the future. But as for now, this is as far as I am willing to speak on this topic. So finally, I have this beautiful code for parsing PNG files. Mind you, I did this in GD script no less because I am truly a sucker for pain. And by now, I know someone in the comment is typing, hey, if you just use C Sharp, there's a library for that. Well, sir or madam, it's too late for that, isn't it? And look, as I said before, we got to learn something new. So it's, it's, it's worth it, right? All right, moving on to the final touch. Shaders in Godot unfortunately do not take arrays as a parameter, so I can't simply hand over the index information. Instead, I had to make a texture with these indices as the color values. Then I can finally add the logic to replace the colors based on the index texture. Now, where do I go from here? You can probably already see all the cool things you could do with it, like applying separate colors for highlights and shadows, or like making color animation for hair only. Look, Bob is Super Saiyan now. Applications are endless, and I'm quite happy with the result. Now, with the recent news and more people migrating over to Godot, I want to start contributing to the community more. So I'll put the GitHub link to this code in the description for anyone to use. Also, I found this one bug in Godot while working on this feature. 
and I want to try my hand at fixing the bug myself. After all, that's one of the benefits of using open source engine. So if you want to see that, make sure to subscribe and click on the notification button so you don't miss it. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you all later.